Good morning. Let's search our hearts this morning. I just want to prepare our hearts for communion this morning. So when we come to the Lord's table, we are making a declaration. Each time that we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are declaring that we have decided that Jesus is our only Savior and Lord. He is our only shepherd and guide, and we express gratitude from the deepest parts of our being for our salvation from our life apart from Jesus. We have been reconciled with God. Forgiveness, freedom from guilt, the removal of shame, victory over death, eternal life, power to not sin, the transforming presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. All of this and more is ours by grace. We are members of God's family by grace. Let us take a minute to thank God and search our hearts this morning. Jesus, we are so thankful for you. We are so thankful that you paid it all for us that you left nothing out. God, that you paid it all. We are so thankful for the grace that has been given that covers us so completely. We are so grateful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So this morning as we were preparing for communion, Actually, this week, as we were thinking and preparing on leading communion, I was um, just reminded of um, generational blessing and that we serve a very generational God who loves to give his blessing on family lines and generationals for generations, for a thousand generations. And so, I was, as I was reminded of that, I just, I wanted us to do something a little bit different this morning. I know that many of us here, myself included, are we're still contending for people on our in our families, in our immediate families and in our family line. Our families can bring great generational blessing, but they can also bring generational curse. And so I believe that today that there is provision from the Lord to bless our family lines, that if we are willing to stand in and stand for those who, are, who have yet to receive Christ, that there's provision here today for the Lord to come and to, to cleanse and bless our family lines for generations to come. And I am one that stands here before you that made a decision with my husband 26 years ago. And that changed the whole trajectory of our family. We didn't know Christ before. We got saved. My mom got saved. And because of that, Many of my beautiful family members are in heaven with Christ today. And I can look out here and I can see my family, my children, and my grandchildren because I made a decision, because we made a decision. And we have no idea how far-reaching one decision is and the ripple effect that it has in our families for generations to come. We have the authority to bless our family line generationally. So this morning, I would like you to gather with your families this morning. I want you to stand. I want you to, um, you can move about the place if you need to, but I want you to stand with your family and I want you to almost be in a circle so you can see each other. So you can look at each other. I know it's a little bit difficult, but just stand with your family. And if you don't have a family member here with you today, join with someone else. Because we are going to pray and believe for generational blessing to flow in this house today. We're going to pray and believe for those that don't know Christ yet to come to Christ. And we are going to pray and believe that the Lord wants to do a work in our generational lines. And we're going to declare that this morning as we take communion. So before we take the emblems, I'm just going to pray 
this generational blessing as we gather with our families this morning to do that. So bow your heads with me as we pray. Jesus, as we take communion, please forgive me and my family for our sin. Lord, we come to you on their behalf as an intercessor, and we are asking you to forgive us. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, and I ask you to redeem us from our sin and reconcile us to Christ. Have mercy, grace on us, and cause my family to bow before you. Deliver our family from sickness, from disease, from pain, from shame, from guilt, from depression, from worry, from anger, from stress, from poverty, from lack, and every curse. As I drink the cup of blessing and as I eat the bread, I declare that my family is free from sin, that it will no longer control us, that we will have freedom from transgressions and willful disobedience, will have freedom from iniquities and generational curses. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse and heal my bloodline. They are covered in the blood of Jesus, receiving peace of mind, freedom to prosper, blessing, favor, and victory in every area of their lives. I celebrate the benefits of the cross over each family member for salvation, for healing, for protection, for prosperity, for mental and emotional health. And God, we ask all of this in your beautiful name. We thank you so much, God, that you love generational blessing, that you love pouring out your blessing over the generations, God. And we thank you for everyone here today that has said yes to you and has caused, Lord, a trajectory in their own family lines, God, to be a generation that serves you over and over and over again. Generation after generation, God, it is our inheritance, and we are so thankful for you. So thankful for this, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes. So, Father, we take this bread this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. A remembrance of me. Let us drink together. 1 Corinthians 11.26, Paul ends with these words. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whenever we participate in the Lord's Supper, we remember that one day we will eat bread and drink the cup with Jesus in heaven. We look forward to that great day and that sure hope. Deuteronomy 7.9 the generation. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is faithful. God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations. A thousand generations. And lavishes his unfailing love onto those who love him and obey his commands. So, Father, we thank you that we get to stand before you this morning and take this covenant before you. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for what you've done for each one of us. We are thankful for what you are going to do in those in our family line, Lord God. And Lord, we declare everything that was spoken here today, Lord Father, that will come to pass. So Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. So, Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.
So let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your abundance. Um, God, you've given us everything. Lord, we are so confident that a little bit less with you engaged in our finances and in our life is better than 100% of everything that we have. God, it's better to be with you than without you. God, nothing with you is still net gain. In Jesus' name. And so, Lord, we just pray you'd bless the, the tithes and the offerings and the financial stewardship of this house and this place. God, that it would bring glory to your name in Athabasca and the area. And God, that, uh, that it would be for our benefit to do that. God, we want to be good stewards of what you've given us. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it might be. Hey, Nicole, how you doing? I didn't know you were going to be here. You should come up and share. You want to? Yeah. I'm like that. Come on. What's God doing in your life, Nicole? It's so good to have you this morning. She's like, yeah. You want to? You don't have to. Now that you're halfway up here. <laughs> Gotta say hi. What's God doing in my life? For those of you that don't know me, my name is Nicole. Oh, I'm in Athabasca right now. But I am currently a third-year college student at Eston College in Regina, Saskatchewan. Have two. I just finished Christian theology. That was a big. My brain is fried. Um, but I have two more classes, and then I get to graduate. <laughs> What's Jesus doing in my life? Jesus is doing a lot of things in my life. Um, the biggest one right now is he actually, <laughs> well, so some of you might remember I went to Turkey last year on a short-term missions trip. This year, Jesus has opened the door for me to go and do an internship for 12 weeks in Turkey. Um, so that's kind of scary, but also exciting because little Nicole in a city full of foreign, not known to me, strangers. And then there's like, how many of them? Like 16 million people in Istanbul. Like, I'm this small. And then that's, I, I told myself I was going to go and take jiu-jitsu lessons because I just need to protect myself. Not that those people, not that Turks are scary or anything. I just, for my own well-being, I just feel like I should be able to like, yeah. And 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 for my dad, my dad, he 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 wants me to be protected. But um, yeah, Jesus has has been like growing and stretching me and kind of just like throwing these things at me that I feel like I can't tackle. But then he's like, no, like I. I've got you, like I've given you the things that you need to be able to tackle this. And so hopefully in May, maybe early June, I'll be flying over and just doing some language learning and all those things and, and meeting with, with uh, the team there and then discerning if that's where Jesus is calling me to go. So yeah, Jesus has called me to be a missionary whether that's overseas or in Canada, I just need to say yes. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot. That's awesome. Yes, you, can I sit down? Can I go? Can I go now, please? Yes. She's like, I'm never coming back. <clears throat> no. Um, so she needs some prayer. Obviously, for direction, is this what God is leading her to? She's moving towards going on this short-term missions trip. Um, so we need to support her too. I want to. I want to challenge you this morning to go and and um, you know and say, hey, how can I? How can I help? How can I support? So um, awesome, Nicole. Thank you for being so flexible too. Isn't that kind of like Bible school stuff, right? It's like, hey, come on, you're up. Let's go. Hopefully, they do that there. They did it when I was there. But but um, okay, this morning, Heather. We've got a couple testimonies this morning. Heather, why don't you come and share what God is doing in your life? So what we do is if, if there's something God's doing in your life, um, it doesn't have to be the exact same the thing that Heather's going through or, or God's, uh, God's working on her with. But um, if there's something that you want to share, I want to encourage you to come and talk to me. So the first Sunday of every month, we do Testimony Sunday. So we like to have two or three people come and share what God is doing in their life. And it's Heather's birthday today. And Sarah's. Sweet. 
So we could sing happy birthday now. We could. It could happen. We are going to sing happy birthday before we eat our meal as well. So I guess we'll maybe we'll leave it for that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So um, it seems like I come up here an awful lot. Um, uh, so lately, um, I have been flooded with a lot of memories of people and places and things from my childhood. Um, and I've realized that that was God reaching out to me. Um, if a lot of you don't, some of you probably don't know, um, I wasn't raised in the church, so I didn't know, um, I wasn't in this environment growing up. Um, so, um, some of you have heard my testimony of when I was in my early 20s, um, and I had decided that I was an atheist. Um, that was strongly influenced by the person I was dating at the time. Uh, when I think back to that time of my life my test and my testimony now, um, although it was only a three-year relationship, um, I feel like I've made it a lot bigger um, and a lot longer um, when I talk about it. So I asked God, I said, you know, like, why did I let that part of my life become so big um, and kind of overtake a lot of my thoughts and my feelings? Um, at that time in my life, I was searching for something to fill a void. Um, and I see now that uh, what I was searching for was right there in front of me. <laughs> um, so I was caught up in the world around me and um, I just never saw him, um, even though he was reaching out. So in Romans 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's, God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I realize now that when we are younger, we are influenced way more than what we want to admit. Okay. Um, by the people we're spending time with, by the things that we're watching and we're hearing. Um, as a teenager and a young adult, um, we want to show the world that, you know, we're independent and we're all grown up and, um, you know, we, spread, we, we need to spread our wings as we say it. But are we really independent or are we just still searching and following something different? Um, so some of the some for some independence also means going completely opposite of how you were raised. Um, I've heard lots of stories of people who were raised in the church and they just completely turned away from the church and from God, and you know they went a separate way. For me, that wasn't it because I was I didn't grow up in the church, so um, I just went my own way, anyways. <laughs> um, so I think I, I was thinking about our youth. Um, in our in our congregation and in our community and wonder how we can best support them through these years and encourage them to stay on God's path um, and continually seek Him. Um, I recently heard about one of our young people from our church that's away at school and some of the some of the stressful things that's going on in her life and I think I said I wouldn't give a million dollars to go back to that time. Um, we as adults, we don't understand what they're going through right now. Um, it is completely different than what any of us went through. Um, we're in a whole new world. <laughs> whole new world. Um, so I think it's really important now more than ever for us to be there for our young people. Um, I said earlier that the last little while I have had memories surface of events and people in my childhood that I know that God was reaching out to me um, by putting those people in my life. And I keep wondering why I didn't see them sooner. 
In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I guess my answer is that I wasn't seeking him. <laughs> um, actually, I don't think I actually knew how to. Um, so the last little while, one of my questions has been, who am I in Christ? Um, I believe that the Lord is showing me through these memories um, that he has chosen, that he's chosen to share with me, that I am his child, I am his bride, and that he has never given up on me. Um, I've told the story of my friend who responded to my comment about God in the early stages of my journey. I would always say, if I can't see him, how can I believe in him? His response was, maybe if you start to believe, then you'll start to see. The scripture in John chapter 20, 27 says, don't give in to your doubts any longer, just believe. I think in every Bible I have, I have that highlighted because um, it just it just brings me back to that moment because that seemed to be that starting point um, where I actually listened and started to listen for him. So I kind of have to laugh at my testimony because I realize that I jump around a lot <laughs> and I'm a little bit OCD. Um, so I like things to be in order. Um, I actually found a Bible app that lets you read the Bible in a chronological order. That was a really happy day for me. Um, <laughs> and it still is. Um, so it is said that the Lord has a sense of humor. And I can see that. It is not lost on me um, in my testimony because my testimony is not chronological. Um, God is revealing things to me in His time and in His way. I believe that this is because events wouldn't have the same impact or clarity if it was done in order. I've already done those in order, and I didn't have any clarity. So now he's taking over. So I was encouraged to go back to significant times in my life by Pastor Dave um, and ask God to show me where he was in those moments. Uh, he has done that and continues to show me that. He has been there in every moment. Even in the midst of my denial, he was still there trying to get my attention. So, be there an ear for our young people is what my advice to you, and even us old ones, because we need the ears too. And the hard ask the hard questions, and remember that God's timing is always perfect. That's what I'm learning right now. Thank you, Heather. I I think that's the the big one is our timing is not God's timing, and God's timing is not our timing. And we have our idea of timing, <laughs> and in eternity, He'll show us the completeness of His timing and what what he's been doing and what he's been orchestrating behind the scenes. And, and it, I, I'm, I'm convinced it'll blow us away. So speaking of timing, Mike, come and share what God's been doing in your life. Well, uh, thanks Dave. Um, you know, it's probably been several months now that David's been trying to get me up here <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've always said I'm not quite ready yet, not quite ready yet. And then it's a couple weeks ago and I just woke up in the morning and it was like, March 3rd, you're going to speak in church. <laughs> so I texted Dave, I said, put me down for March 3rd. That's when it's going to happen. So, gotcha. <laughs> but you know what? It's just like, this is my obedience right now. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> So, so those that don't know me, I'm Mike Pelcher. I'm Norma Jean's husband. Everybody knows Norma Jean. Uh, I lived in Athabasca for 32 years. Uh, before Athabasca, I lived in Calgary and also lived in Pinocchio and whatnot, a couple other places. But I grew up in I grew up in various places in Canada. Canada. I was in, born in BC, lived in Ontario for a while, and then we moved out west here uh, with my dad getting a job out at one of the power plants there. But basically, I grew up in a non-Christian home. 
It wasn't something part of my life. It was just not, not something that we, we believed in. But I do recall on a few occasions, you know, mom, mom taking us to church. Just an odd time. I remember being there. I remember taking communion a couple of times as a kid. I remember that. And I've also seen pictures of me as a baby being baptized. I'm pretty sure it was me. Mom tells me it's me. It must be me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, it kind of looks like me when I look at the other pictures. So, I, you know, my my mamer, my mom's mom, was a strong Catholic. So, you know, I kind of felt that it was either, you know, something that my mom felt obligated to do or something like that. But either way, you know, we didn't really grow up with a lot of belief in Jesus in the household. You know, I do remember a few times mom would, you know, a thunderstorm would go on. She'd grab the holy water and start sprinkling around the house, like protecting the house and doing that as kids. I remember a few things like that. But I mainly remember my folks were social. They had parties. There was lots of drinking, lots of smoking, that stuff going on in the household. So we as kids grew up pretty independent. You know, we had four, four of us in the family and we had... Uh, you know, we we were we learned a lot about life pretty early, and we were independent going forward. You know, I, I give my parents credit; they did a pretty good job. I feel like we all all four of us ended up, you know, finishing school. We all ended up with decent jobs. We had houses, cars, kids, all that kind of stuff, um, and we all had generally good values. We we treated people properly and all that kind of stuff. So, from a worldly standpoint, it felt like you know things were fairly okay. Being a non-believer didn't seem to have any impact on my life. I thought, you know, my life's good, everything's fine. And it really wasn't in me to give control over to somebody else. I was a control guy, I'm going to manage this life myself and I can, I can do this. So it wasn't really in my DNA to do that. Uh, my first marriage broke up in 2010. Uh, we, we were together fairly young. We had two kids, and they're great kids. They have similar values as me. They're hardworking, they're independent, whatnot. And they know how to take care of themselves. Um, I'm always proud of them. They're great kids. But it's always tough. A breakup in a marriage is always tough on kids, and they manage to get through there well enough. So um, I'm, I'm glad for that. Well, enough for that background. But, you know, shortly after that, well... I met Norma Jean, the good little Christian girl. <laughs> and I just said, there's something about this Christian girl, this Norma Jean, there's something about her. But, you know, not having a, a good relationship with Jesus or any relationship at that time with Jesus, I can only see so much, right? You can only see so much in people. But I still thought, you know, I got to brush up on a few things here. I dating a Christian girl, I better, I better learn something. So I, I either bought a Bible or found a Bible or something like that. And <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to brush up on a, a few things. But I, I tell you, you know, the Bible is not an easy read. <laughs> you, you can't just skim through a Bible and get the high points of it. <laughs> I, you know, I was reading with my mind rather than my heart. And it's just, it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of jumbled words, really. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, it, you know, I had that struggle and go through. It's like, I can't, I don't, I don't understand this at all. So, you know, Norma tried bringing me to, you know, church there in Church Park where she was and her small group there. I tried to get in involved with that. But honestly, there was just some judgment that was being felt as a non-believer. It's hard to get through that judgment. There's, you know, people wondering, you know, not thinking alike and all that kind of stuff. So it just re reconfirmed to me that, you know what, that's not for me. I just, I'm perfectly fine with my current belief system. I'm good. I don't need. I don't need. I don't need anything more than that. You know, the thing is, as you go through life, you learn certain things, and you you establish your own belief system of all the stuff that goes on throughout your life. So you you learn things like, you know, the world is round. There's a billion or so stars out there in the solar system. You know, this Earth has been around for five billion or so years. Like, how do you match that up? with any of the Bible. But you know what? You can't just flip a switch in that belief. But I believe God puts bridges in place. And I'll just talk a little bit about that later. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Well, I just couldn't believe differently. It was the way was, I was thinking. 
I need, really needed to figure stuff out before I move forward. Well, Norma moved up to Athabasca and we married in 2014. She had left the church in Sherwood Park and, you know, she was torn about being part of the body and being part of a church. So this went on for a few years and then she found Aspen Ridge here in 2018. And I, I've never had a problem with, with Norma and going to church and her beliefs and my beliefs. And it worked out quite well. We respected each other dearly and, and knowing each other's point of view. And it all worked out. We would support each other all, always through that process. You know, and occasionally she would bring me to church here and I would, I would hum a few words, tap a few feet and, you know, do, you know, do as the Romans win in Roman, you know, you know <laughs> just do what you need to do. It just seemed, seemed pretty good. I didn't really have any beliefs in it, but it seemed pretty good. And, and truly, it was okay. This group was great. I didn't feel the judgment I felt before. And, you know, I created a relationship with a lot of people without really having a connection with Jesus and it kind of worked out. It was seemed to be fine with me, and I thought it was good. I, uh, I, I don't know. Those who know me, I like golf. I like golf a lot. Not a little bit, a lot. <laughs> so Norma and I used to joke quite a bit about uh, the thing. Like, her church was like my golf. Like, she'd go to church on Sunday, I'd go golfing on Sunday. She'd go to church on Sunday, I'd go golfing on Sunday. Once in a while, you know, she'd come golfing with me, and I'd show her what I do in golfing, and she'd go to church with her. It was great. It was, it was going along just great. It was all good. You know, once in a while, share back and forth. It was good. Well, this went on for several years. And then Norma. <laughs> she breaks the deal. <laughs> Can you imagine the good little Christian girl breaking the deal like that? I find out that Norma and her gang of friends, I think they call themselves the Soul Sisters or something like that, eh? Like... <laughs> They start praying for me. <laughs> they're praying for me. I find out the Soul Sisters and Norma, they're all praying for me. You know what? And Norma wants me to go to heaven. She's sad. She cries sometimes. She says, no, I, I want you to be in heaven. We had it all worked out. We got, before we got married, we talked about this. It says, no problem. I, I know Norma. She's going to heaven for sure, right? She's going to go up there. She'll look around, find me an opening in the back gate or something like that. <laughs> I have no problem with that. It's like, when I'm ready, I'll get up there. She'll sneak me in the back. I'm good. Everything will be good. Well, all, you know, now she tells me, I can't sneak you in the back gate. It's like, what? You can't sneak me in the back gate? She said, Jesus is the gatekeeper. There is no back gate. I'm like, what? There's no back gate. I had this plan. It was all good. <laughs> She says, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not getting in. That's the only way in. <laughs> so, you know, I just have to say the power of prayer is huge. You plant a seed, you water it a little bit, and the Lord will grow it. It came to me last year, just as a game of golf, that you can't do anything unless you put some attention to it. You got to focus on it. You got to devote some time around it. So here I am. I'm loaded with the seeds of prayer, and I'm talking. They're spilling out of my pocket, and they're just all over the place. God is growing in me, and it's growing pretty fast here. He starts pointing me in the Scripture. Well, I begin reading daily devotionals, like reading with deep understanding. All of a sudden, I understand this stuff, and I'm like, I didn't understand it before. It helped. Norma picked up this nice little birdies, bogeys, and life lessons from the game of golf. <laughs> 52 devotionals. <laughs> and, it, and it links devotionals to all the stereos around golf, all the you know, great, great moments in golf. Great little book. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> that helped. <laughs> Just things like that. Um, you know, things weren't jumbled anymore. You know, reading, reading scripture... And there's, there's a lot of meaning to a lot of those scriptures. One day you read something, and it means one thing. And then next thing, you read it a different way, and it reads a different way. Like, I couldn't believe the amount of stuff is in there and the diversity of that book. It was really exciting me, and it was really beginning to flow within me, the excitement I was seeing and reading scripture and doing all that kind of stuff. 
Well, you know, that was great. Later on last year, about uh, June, uh, mom, my mom started beginning her journey out of this world. Her health was declining for a while. You know, she's, she was 89. And you remember all the smoking and drinking and stuff I told you about? Well, eventually your body catch up, up to you. So one day we're nearing the end there, Norm and I are there, and, and uh, she tells Norm and I, she sees the light. You know, and, and mom has this fearful look in her face, and she had that fearful look. I've seen it before on a few occasions because she's been up and down on several years there of passing away and not passing away, but I could always see that fear in her eyes. So I seen that. And Norma was like, well, the light's a lot better than the darkness, that's for sure. <laughs> and she's like, good point. <laughs> <laughs> she was pretty excited about that. She perked right up. Norma started praying to her. You know, at some point, Norm's praying. Mom stops her, looks at her and says, Hey, you're religious. What's going on? You're religious. And, you know, Mom, you can't fool Mom. She, she knows there's something up here. What's going on? You're trying to sell me you'll use vacuum? Or what's happening here? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and, and Norma's just like, uh, I corrected her. And, you know, uh, not at all. I'm not religious at all. I just love Jesus, she says. That's it. And mom just, her tone just changed. Ah, that's great, she says. I love Jesus too. Simple. You know, and I could see, you know, I could see the contentment in her eyes just change, just like that. And I sat there and watched my mother, I watched my wife, and I could see the presence of the Lord just there. You could see the change in that moment. That's incredible. You know, she died very peacefully about a week later. She was family around her. It was fantastic. It, you know, death go, it was great. So it was pretty exciting. You know, so starting to hear the word, see the presence of the Lord, you know, it was very exciting. About two months after that, my 32-year-old son, out of the blue, became diagnosed with a rare, highly, highly aggressive cancer. You know, we prayed. Norm and I prayed. You know, this church prayed. Everybody was praying. We had Edmonton churches praying that we knew. We had BC churches praying that we knew. You know, heck, Rita G. Seen us on the beach there. We first, when Mark, before he was diagnosed, but he knew he had cancer or he knew that something was up. He wanted to go see a doctor. Rita G. picked it up and she just said, Can I pray for your son, Mark? And she went around us and she prayed. She was on it. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I have to say that early detection saved my son. Those early prayers landed, and God lined up those doctors, those specialists, and they treated exactly what he needed to be done. He went through three months of intense chemo, 15 radiation treatments, and it did the job. He finished healing. He's finished and healing now. He's moving on from that chapter. Again, power of prayers. Like those early prayers, and those doctors knew what to do. They hammered him hard, and he's tough and strong. He was able to handle it. It was really good. I had a friend there, Darcy, he had went through cancer a year or so previous to that. During conversation, he said, you know, there's tough times during the chemo treatment. And he gave me, he gave me this prayer. And it was simple. It was like, God, or Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I seen incredible strength in my son during that time. I was a proud father to see that in him. And I knew, but I knew, you know, Mark's sister and his mother made sure Mark wasn't alone very much in the hospital as he was there for three months solid, basically. But I knew there'd be times that Mark would be lying there and in the hospital, but he would never be alone if Jesus was beside him. And so I tried to make sure that, you know, give him a little bit of words to help him along there how he receives it and so he's in this process but you know hopefully this generational stuff goes on Deanna as we all pray for you know early on when Mark was diagnosed it was tough you know thought of losing a son and was overwhelming but you know what God pulled through he talked to Norma right away and he said he will live and ever since that day I never doubted it I was I was never in doubt that peace rooted in, and it was solid at that point in time. Never had, a, never had a concern. You know, the growth has accelerated with me. 
in me. Jesus has raised the bar. You know, what I once thought was a pretty good life, but now I see how much better it can be. You don't see those things without uh, him, him touching upon you. You know, things are going fast. I mean, I was a seed, and there's seeds, and there's buds, and there's branches. It's starting to grow, and I'm, I'm excited about it. I even have a desire to pray for my family and pray for people. I have a desire to read the scripture. It's all good. There's something about, you know, having Jesus in your life that, you know, you don't, you don't know it until it's there. I lived a long life already without him in there, and then you, then you find him in there. It's pretty incredible. You know, those thoughts that once held me back, the thoughts of releasing control, you know, I can't lose control. I, you know, I thought I couldn't do that. But, you know, it's actually making me humble that I can lay things down at his feet. And it really makes, a, makes, makes me stronger within him. It's very, very powerful. And he is powerful and almighty. Fears will disappear when he's sitting beside you. It's that easy. One of the words that I got earlier on or during prayer and fasting this year was a pretty powerful time. He, he just said, bring, it was bring him in. Simple, bring him in. You just have to use him as a conduit for his light to shine. That's all you need to do. Dave will remember this. One of the early conversations with Pastor Dave, which at the time I never appreciated, but I do right now. You know, Dave? <laughs> I do appreciate it, Dave. He calls me into his office. Sits me down in his chair like I've gone to the principal's office, right? <laughs> I sit down. He's like, eh, so, Mike, <laughs> I think it's time. <laughs> Norma's a believer. You have all the traits and values, etc. It's time. And my response was something like, uh, so how do you do that, Dave? Um, well, you just believe. I'm like, I can't just flip a switch and believe differently and start believing. It made no sense to me at the time, Dave. Well, Dave, you're right. You just need to turn the light on. <laughs> That's it. Let the light throw flu. Just turn the light on. That's all you need to do. You know... I dig around my house and look around. I must have 30 flashlights laying around. They're in the drawers, they're in the covers, they're in the garage, they're in the basement. You know, grandkids love playing with flashlights. You ever notice what kids do with flashlights? They look for dark places and light them up. That's pretty simple. They take that light and they look for a dark place behind a couch in a closet somewhere and they turn that light on and they light things up. It's simple. Kids are, kids are very, you can learn a lot from kids. So go find some dark places and light them up. This is what I've been, that's what we need to do. I, I am thankful for all the cedars, you know, the wife and the soul sisters, all that kind of stuff. You know, those praying soul sisters. I'm even thankful for, after that thing, I'm thankful for my mamere, my grandmother, who probably prayed for me way back then. That this is, this is, you know, it takes a lot. You know, there's a lot of, been, been a lot of bridge builders too. I mean, Greg, golfing buddy, Cookie and Jarrett, we have these discussions about the Bible when we're doing our golfing thing. A lot of stuff going on there. McDonald, I don't know where he's at, but he's around. You know, you talk about the Bible, you get break, building these bridges. There's a five billion year gap that you need to fill in. So it's important to kind of do, do a little bit of that. And you know what? A lot of waters. David, Dana, Merg, Thomas, Leo, Deanna. I can't, I can name a whole bunch of them. But they're all sported me and my wisdom along the path, gave me wisdom along the path as it was going along. But let's remember one thing. I'm pretty sure Reg can help me with this, Reg. Where does that light come from? Jesus. Jesus. Where's all the glory go? To him. to him. The glory is to him. It's from him and to him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah. What an amazing celebration for us as a church. Um, walking alongside Norma for 
years and walking alongside Mike as well. And I think many times I've, I've even verbalized this to people where I'm like, he's a better believer than some believers. And he doesn't even believe. Like God's put the, 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 the seeds and the roots of the gospel in Mike. And now as, as he's turned his heart over to Jesus and, and now the acceleration of what God's doing in his life. And you alluded to that a little bit, Mike, in your story, but it's, it's amazing to sit down across the table from Mike and him, the spirit of God speak through him to you. I'm like, this is the guy that was like, ah, Dave, I mean, it's just, nah, you know, it's not for me. You know, it's not right now. I'm just not there yet. Same thing with the testimony. I'm like, Mike, you got to share what God's doing. That's a part of the gospel. I want to say this. If you've not shared with someone lately or at all what God has done in your life, you got to check your spiritual pulse. Now, that's getting heavy, but guys, you really do. Part of the gospel is declaring it. He's speaking it out. So I'm like, Mike, you got to share. He's like, I don't know. Uh, give me some time. And I'm like, okay, all right. And then I think I asked you, I only asked you like twice. And then I'm like, well, you, you tell, it seemed like a lot. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, you tell me when you're ready. You tell me when you're ready. And then I didn't, I didn't ask him again. And then all of a sudden I get this text. I think I'm ready. And I'm like, yes, it's good. <clears throat> but man, oh man, the spirit of God, when he, when he makes the word alive to you, is a miraculous thing. As a believer, you've read the same, I know people who've been believer their whole lives for, for many decades, and you read the same scripture over and over and over, and it's like, yeah, I know what that scripture means. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God lights on it, and you're like, whoa, man, I've, I've never read that scripture before in my life, it seems, how he works in us. And so it's, what an awesome celebration. I remember being in Slave Lake, Norma tells us after that weekend, and I might get this a little bit wrong, but essentially, Mike says to her, because we brought him on a leadership weekend. He's not a believer. It's like, uh, you're not supposed to do that, Dave. I'm like, I'm telling you, yeah, you do that. You, you know how you seed into someone's life? You just bring them around you and you bring the gospel with you and you share Jesus with you in the whole situation. So we're in the room. We're prophetically praying and prophesying over each one. And then we come to Mike. <laughs> and Mike does a wonderful job of just saying the things that he sees over people's life and just positively reinforcing the things, which he's always been kind of good at anyway. So it's, it's a natural gift for him. But then the room comes around to who is in the hot seat. And Mike is coming. And I'm like, the presence of God is just getting all over me. And I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> and I remember it was intense for me just saying some of the things and just declaring God's love over you, Mike. And then on the weekend on the way home, he says to Norma, maybe, you know, maybe God's got me on this journey so that when I do come to him, that I'll be able to, to share the gospel with people just like me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my, it's a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. And it's, it's so good. It's so good. So I want to say this, those of you who have loved ones who don't know Christ, wear Jesus on your sleeve. Wear Jesus on your sleeve. Wear what he's doing in your life on your sleeve. Get people praying for you, with you, for you, with them. The seeds that Mike sees, like they're spilling out all over him, right? And now to see him speaking to believers' lives as the Spirit of God has made his heart alive, it's just amazing. It's so awesome. So what an encouragement for us as a church and as a body. And um, yeah, it's a victory, guys. Yeah, Woo! <laughs> And the glory is to, it's to him. It's from him and it goes to him. It's his, it's about his glory. And he has our best in mind in, 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 as we walk through it. So awesome. Thanks for sharing, Mike. Leo. Journeys of life. Hey, Heather, thank you for sharing. God never stops. Right? He never stops. The stories we're going to hear from Mike and his journey, just starting. And uh, it's been uh, exciting watching Mike's journey, actually. It's been amazing. He showed up here in a New Year's Eve service just to come and hang out with us and pull kids around on a toboggan. And, and now he's here. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that we got today, the testimonies, and Lord, that these testimonies speak to our hearts. It encourages us to share our testimony with those around us, to be confident, to be bold, 
So Lord, we thank you for Heather and uh, Mike with sharing what they, the Lord has done in their lives. So Lord, we ask you to bless our meal and those the hands that prepared it, and we just give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.